the Latvian chemist Wilhelm Ostwald. He articulated the idea that a catalyst is a substance that accelerates the rate of a chemical reaction without being part of either the reactants or the products. We all have an intimate relationship with molecules, but most of the time we are just not aware of it. It might be drugs, agrochemicals, molecules that can store and relay information, or that can harvest sunlight and convert it into electricity. Our knowledge of how to design and make such molecules in an efficient and sustainable manner is closely linked to the progress of our society, and it often involves catalysis. As a matter of fact, the formation of almost all molecules that we are made of and use in everyday life involve catalysis. Many organic molecules can exist as non-identical mirror images of each other. It is just like with our hands. Same, but mirror images. Such molecular mirror images <coughs> can have different properties. For example, one mirror image of a medicine can have the desired effect, while the other has an undesired or no effect at all. There is thus a need to be able to selectively produce only the mirror image of a molecule that has the desired property. Today this can, for example, be achieved by using enzymes or asymmetric metal catalysis. The use of low molecular weight organic molecules as catalysts for chemical transformation is not a new phenomenon. Indeed, it can be traced back to the year 1860 when the German chemist Liebig reported that acetaldehyde catalyzes the hydrolysis of cyanogen into oxamide. The work by Benjamin List and David Macmillan in the year 2000 resulted in a turning point. There is a very clear before and after they conceptualized the area of asymmetric organic catalysis and have provided organic chemistry with a powerful tool for selectively making only one of the two possible mirror images of organic molecules. Since then, the research area has exploded and as a result, we today have a number of small organic molecules that catalyze many different reactions. These catalysts can be used to manufacture molecules for our society. Organic catalysis also holds great promises as a sustainable technology. We are now looking forward to the lectures by this year's Nobel laureates in chemistry. Benjamin List was born in 1968 in Frankfurt am Main in Germany. He obtained his PhD in 1997 from the Goethe Universität in Frankfurt. He is currently director at the Max Planck Institute for Kohlenforschung in Mülheim an der Ruhr. Benjamin List, I now welcome you onto the stage. We are very much looking forward to your lecture. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm deeply honored with this great recognition and I would like to thank the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences as well as the Nobel Committee and everybody else who was involved in making this amazing prize a possibility. I would also like to use this opportunity to thank my brilliant and, and really truly awesome co-workers that I had the pleasure to working with 
during the last 22 years for their hard work, dedication, and, and their brilliant ideas that they brought into this fantastic adventure. And last but not least, I would also like to thank all the other scientists that during the last two decades or so have made organocatalysis what it is right now, a vibrant, very dynamic, very productive field that has really made a change to chemical synthesis. Thank you all so very much. I am deeply fascinated with the science of catalysis because if you think about it, a catalyst by providing a lower energy pathway to convert substrates into the desired product is as close as chemists can ever come to magic. Because if you think about it, this providing a lower energy pathway enables us to use a tiny little amount of a catalyst to convert large amount of starting materials into a useful product or material. And this is something I find incredible. But the beauty of catalysis is that it is also a very important technology. Some would even say perhaps the most important technology that we have on the planet for humanity. And in fact, people have estimated that catalysis contributes to roughly one third of the GDP. These are figures in the trillions. And I would also say that probably there is no other technology who could claim to feed, to heal, to warm, and to transport us and our goods. The last point I'd like to make for catalysis is that the challenges humanity faces right now, global warming, energy conversion, all these issues will have to be addressed with the help of catalysis. And I have no doubt that catalysis will continue to deliver like it did in the past. Now, by no means am I the only one interested in catalysis. In the history of chemistry, this has always been a very, very appealing concept to chemists. And this is also reflected in the history of Nobel Prizes that were given to catalysis researchers. The very first catalysis Nobel Prize was given in 1909 to Wilhelm Oswald. And Oswald actually was recognized for his pioneering studies uh, on the general physical chemical aspects of catalysis. But Oswald also was very much aware of the fact that enzymes, which were known to be efficient asymmetric catalysts, are by no means different to the chemical catalysts that chemists have made. And there's one interesting vision that uh, Oswald proposed in 1905 in a book review, actually, in which he suggested that one day chemists will be able to create organic catalysts, as he called them, organische Katalysatoren, that rival the selectivity and efficiency of enzymes, but are thermally more stable. And this was expressed in 1905. So quite remarkably, actually, his graduate student, Bredig, Georg Bredig, in 1910, realized this vision already by describing a cinchona alkaloid catalyzed HCN addition to benzaldehyde. And this is actually a reaction that is also catalyzed by enzymes. And Bredig found in a reproducible way that enantioselectivity was actually obtained in this process. Remarkably, though, chemists have at that point chosen to almost completely devote their attention to transition metal-based catalysts. And this is reflected again in a history of amazing Nobel Prize winners. For example, Sabatier in 1912 discovered that finely dispersed transition metal powders can actually catalyze hydrogenation reaction of organic compounds. And along those lines, Haber and Bosch, of course, discovered what is probably one of the most important chemical reactions for our life on this planet, the Haber-Bosch synthesis of ammonia, which is a heterogeneously catalyzed hydrogenation of nitrogen to give ammonia. Bergius developed coal hydrogenation processes, again, with the help of heterogeneous catalysts that delivered fuels, and, and those were at the time, of course, very useful and important. A big change then occurred actually in 1963 when the first Nobel Prize was awarded to work on homogeneous transition metal catalyzed reactions and that the starting point happens to uh, had occurred in Mülheim actually at, in my institute, the Max Planck Institute for Kohlenforschung, when Carl Ziegler discovered homogeneous transition metal complexes that would catalyze polymerization reactions of ethylene and propylene that he and Nutter studied and, and won the Nobel Prize for in 1963. 
And that marked the beginning of homogeneous transition metal catalysis. The next three Nobel Prizes in this series also went to that area. The one that is probably the most relevant for my presentation today and for this Nobel Prize is the Nobel Prize to Knowles, Sharpless, and Noyori, given in 2001 for their pioneering contributions to asymmetric catalysis of redox reactions, hydrogenations, and uh, oxidation reactions. And only four years later, another Nobel Prize was given to a homogeneous uh, transition metal catalyzed reaction, the olefin metathesis to Schrock, Grubbs, and uh, Chauvin. And only again five years later, another Nobel Prize for the same general area was given to Hack, Nagishi, and Suzuki for their pioneering studies on cross-coupling methodologies using transition metal catalysts. So you can say basically the last century was the century of transition metal catalysis. The only exception was actually the recent Nobel Prize to Frances Arnold for her pioneering contributions to the directed evolution of enzymes, biological catalysts that then can be more efficient or catalyze reactions that are unknown uh, in nature. And so with this background, you probably understand the situation that I found when I was a graduate student in the mid 90s. And that was chemists were essentially convinced that when it comes to asymmetric catalysis, the selective production of mirror image molecules, there are only two options available. You can either use enzymes, and as I said, this was already known to Ostwald at the time in 1905 or even before that, or you can use synthetic soluble transition metals as reflected with a Nobel Prize in 2001 to Sharpless, Noyori, and Knowles. And so this was the mindset, and that was the time when I was considering what to do during my postdoc, and I became fascinated with this idea of creating artificial biocatalysts, biocatalysts that would engage in the catalysis of non-natural reactions. And at that time, in the mid to late 90s, one approach appeared to be particularly attractive to me, and that was catalytic antibodies. And I was very fortunate to be able to move to the Scripps Research Institute and to work with uh, Professor Lerner and Barbas on the utilization of aldolase catalytic antibodies. They had just discovered an aldolase catalytic antibody that would catalyze with high efficiency and also very high selectivity aldol reactions. And I was excited to work in this field all of a sudden and I used this antibody to do large-scale experiments, gram-scale experiments. I also used this antibody uh, in the synthesis of natural products actually. But the main thing I was interested in was to understand how this antibody actually does its catalysis. And fortunately, at the time, a crystal structure of this antibody was available. And what that revealed was that in the active site of the antibody, you have on the one hand an amino group derived of lysine residue, and then a water molecule that bridges this amino group to a tyrosine hydroxy group. And for me, this immediately suggested that perhaps the mechanism is in fact a bifunctional mechanism where you have an amino group that, assisted by the acid group, engages in the formation of an aminium ion from a ketone precursor. And this aminium ion formation is actually quite important. It not only lowers the LUMO energy of this system, but it also drastically increases the alpha-CH bond acidity. This has been estimated by Bill Jenks already in, in the 60s, I think. This was done uh, in the context of work on the mechanism of class I aldolases. And so now, the conjugate base of this acid co-catalyst can now abstract a proton to generate an enamine intermediate. So as you can see, this is basically a strategy that biology has developed or evolved, uh, one should say, to enable carb anion equivalent formation under physiological conditions in water without the availability, of course, of stoichiometric organometallic bases. So this enamine then can engage in a direct CC bond formation with an aldehyde, for example, again, assisted by the Brunset acid co-catalyst, which protonates the nascent oxyanion in the transition state to generate the aminium ion of the aldol product. And then hydrolysis occurs once again, assisted by the conjugate base of this acid co-catalyst to generate the aldol product and to regenerate this bifunctional enzyme, as I like to call this. So that was the thinking that I developed. And 
This, in fact, encouraged me much later in, in January of 1999, when I became an assistant professor and when I was thinking about my independent work, to think again along the lines of Oswald. Why is it not possible to design organic, simple molecules that have all the machinery that is needed to catalyze such an aldol reaction? And I realized all that is needed is an amino group and an acid group, right? And so with that, I started to designing potential small molecule catalysts when I remembered, of course, there already is a catalyst like this. There is an amino acid, in fact, that catalyzes aldol reactions. And that is, of course, proline in the famous Hyos Parish edersauer wiechert reaction that was very well known to me, of course, since my undergraduate studies in Berlin. And in this process, proline catalyzes an intramolecular aldol reaction to give these bicyclic ketones, which the idea had been could be useful intermediates in developing industrial routes to steroids. This never became a reality, in fact, because steroids are made from natural products and the supply of these natural products was sufficient. However, it was still an important discovery, somewhat an underappreciated discovery. People were slightly confused, I think, about the mechanism. But in that moment, I realized actually what is probably happening is that proline is just the essence of an aldolase enzyme. It has all that is needed. It has an amino group, actually a privileged amino group for aminium ion and enamine formation, and it has a carboxylic acid that can act as the co-catalyst, the Brunsted acid base co-catalyst. And so this is the hypothesis I developed as a, a fresh assistant professor at Scripps. I hoped that proline would function like a microaldolase, as I called it, by converting first a ketone assisted by the Brunsted acid into the corresponding aminium ion, and then the carboxylate would deprotonate this aminium ion to form the corresponding enamine, and the enamine, in turn, would then be able to react with an aldehyde to form the carbon-carbon bond, where the proton is transferred in the transition state onto the oxygen, the oxyanion of, of the aldehyde that is being formed. And then the aminium ion, in last step, would be hydrolyzed with water to form the aldol product and regenerate the proline catalyst. This was the hypothesis I developed. It's kind of actually the, one of the few catalytic cycles that I designed and that then, when I did the experiment, actually worked. And this is also what happened in this case. I was very excited when I discovered that indeed proline also catalyzes intermolecular aldol reactions of ketones with aldehydes to give very valuable aldol products in really excellent yields and state-of-the-art enantioselectivity also. And I think it is important to mention in this context that the so-called direct asymmetric aldol reaction at the time was considered one of the biggest challenge of asymmetric catalysis, and there had been only one solution to this problem, and that was a sophisticated lanthanum-based, fancy transition metal-based catalyst that was developed in the group of Shibazaki in Japan. And all of a sudden, it turns out, there is now an edible, non-toxic, readily available catalyst that gives the same kind of reactivity with state-of-the-art selectivity. For me, this was a big breakthrough. I was very excited at the time, and we were really happy to see that the reaction was also not limited to one aldehyde, but in fact, we could convert several other aldehydes as well to give the desired aldol products, in some cases, really with enormous enantioselectivity. In fact, we have just submitted a manuscript to organic synthesis, uh, which allows in a reproducible fashion for hopefully all undergraduate students in the world to do these, these experiments on a gram scale. So that was quite exciting. But already during those studies, I realized there is probably more in this kind of chemistry. Proline is not just a microaldolase. Proline is a catalyst that can convert carbonyl compounds catalytically without requiring a stoichiometric reagent or an auxiliary into the corresponding enolate equivalents, right? And so this then led to what we have called, and Macmillan also, my co-laureate, a wonderful colleague, by the way, what we have called a generic activation mode for organocatalysis. So proline actually has this generic activation mode that we have called enamine catalysis. It converts carbonyl compounds into the corresponding enamine. And now this enamine, of course, should not only be able to react with aldehydes in aldol reactions, but it should, in principle, be capable of reacting with any type of electrophile. 
So in principle, it should be able to react with an imine. It should be able to react with a Michael acceptor, even alkyl halides. How about oxygen, nitrosobenzene, dialkyl azo dicarboxylates, and all of these wonderful electrophiles in principle should, according to this catalytic cycle design, engage in such transformations, see X bond formations. And so this was then the program of the following years. And indeed, I could show with my slowly growing group that enamine catalysis is actually a solid concept. And we discovered a number of, of different reactions. I should also emphasize that in these early days, we initiated a collaboration with Professor Ken Haug at UCLA. And that was a very fruitful collaboration in which he provided theoretical computations on the mechanism of our reaction, while we in the meantime did kinetic studies and other mechanistic work. And all of that boiled down to what is now called the Hauk list transition state of the Aldor reaction. And I said this before, you know, who knows the final truth of this mechanism? In any case, this model has a very powerful predictive character, and all of the reaction I will be discussing with you today could have, or indeed had been predicted on the basis of this transition state. For example, our proline catalyzed aldo reaction, the stereochemistry of this is, is well explained with the, with the Hauk list transition state, and so is the stereochemistry of these other two intramolecular aldo reactions we discovered, the enol exoaldolization of dialdehydes to give cyclic aldols, and also the first catalytic asymmetric transannular aldolization to give these natural product precursors that we indeed have used in, in uh, very efficient natural product syntheses. But in addition to carbonyl compounds, as I said before, you can also use other electrophiles. For example, we were excited to find the very first example of a catalytic asymmetric alpha alkylation of an aldehyde. And that is a novel type of reaction because it's not an addition reaction, but it's a nucleophilic substitution reaction. And it also gave cyclic products in excellent enantioselectivities. And already back in 2000, we had shown that Mannich reactions, actually the first catalytic asymmetric three-component Mannich reaction of a ketone, an aldehyde, and an amine can be catalyzed with proline once again. And we made these ketones here, but also a number of other products based on this very general and very powerful and highly useful Mannich reaction. For example, uh, acetaldehyde-derived Mannich products in really excellent enantioselectivity. And last but not least, I would also like to emphasize one example where not a CC bond is generated, but in fact a CN bond in the formation of these alpha hydrazidoaldehydes, which are great precursors to making alpha amino acids, actually. And we found that this reaction can once again be catalyzed by proline with very good selectivities and also very good yields. I should at this point again emphasize that this was then became more and more a field, and many different groups have started to engage in studying enamine catalysis and developing novel reactivity and novel reactions. And this is just a small fraction of all the beautiful transformations that were discovered during those days. Some people called them the gold rush in, in organocatalysis. But I would like to still highlight one additional reaction that I think is kind of timely, and that was a proline catalyzed intermolecular aldol reaction of two different aldehydes. This is actually a development that goes back to work done in my laboratory what, that was later then advanced by my uh, co-laureate, Professor David McMillan. And the group at DSM, actually in the Netherlands, found that this cross-aldolization of two different aldehydes gives an aldol product that can be readily converted into darunavir. And darunavir, as the name suggests, is an antiviral agent and it is used for the treatment of HIV infections. And this probably has been one of the worst pandemics of all time. And it's really rewarding to see that organocatalysis has really contributed in making this more like a treatable disease and, and you don't hear so much anymore about this pandemic. However, enamine catalysis, of course, is not just the whole story. In fact, this is just one example of a generic activation mode that was developed in the context of organocatalysis. Many other generic activation modes have been developed in the meantime. For example, of course, aminium ion catalysis. This is Professor McMillan's main area of research in the early days of organocatalysis, and he has used this very elegantly in cycloadditions and in conjugate additions. But as I said, it also forms the basis of enamine catalysis by this acidification of the alpha-CH bonds. 
But there are other also very powerful generic activation modes. Consider, for example, anion binding catalysis, where hydrogen bonding catalysts bind to anions to generate supramolecular chiral anions that then can engage in nucleophilic addition reactions, for example, with very high enantioselectivity. Very fruitful concept that has led to numerous very important publications in the field of organocatalysis. Azyl ammonium ion catalysis is yet another generic activation mode of organocatalysis where azyl groups are transferred from one substrate to another substrate, and it's, it's also a very powerful organocatalysis strategy widely used all over the world. Uh, carbene catalysis, a very unusual mode of reactivity that is actually quite old, but that also has been massively advanced during the last 20 years, where aldehydes are so-called umpoled, so the aldehyde, which is normally in, is an electrophile, is converted into a nucleophile. And this unusual uh, reactivity can be utilized in many different very elegant and important transformations. And last but not least, the only additional generic activation mode I would like to show here today is, of course, Burnset acid catalysis because of its very high importance that it has gained in recent years, and I will say more to that in just a minute. Suffice to say that this is Again, just a small collection of generic activation modes that came out of organocatalysis. There are many, many more, and all of these generic activation modes have led to numerous different transformations, some of which are even applied on a technical scale in the synthesis of pharmaceuticals and scent molecules, for example. Now, at this point, it's also helpful you know, to organize organocatalysis. And I have found a very useful way in doing so, and this goes along the definition that I prefer, and that is organocatalysis is the catalysis with small organic molecules, where a metal, of course, is not part of the activation principle, and that function by donating or removing electrons or protons. And that automatically creates four sub-areas of organocatalysis, Brunset acid catalysis, Brunset base catalysis, Lewis base catalysis and Lewis acid catalysis, and these are the catalysts that either donate or remove protons or donate or remove electrons. And this actually brings some nice organization into the field of organocatalysis, and it also brings to the surface gaps where actually nobody works on, I found. And my lab, we became particularly interested in the utilization of Lewis acid catalysts. And this is what we are doing actually right now. We are really fascinated with the power and potential of acid catalysis because of its universality. Because after all, all that acids need for catalysis is electron density, and this is pretty much what chemistry is all about. Electron density, right? And so we realized that actually possibly the vast majority of all catalyzable reactions can be catalyzed with acids. And so over the years then, we have advanced our little proline molecule, which is a Brunstead acid, don't forget that it has a pKa of around 20, to much more acidic and also more complicated acids that in the meantime have reached acidities in the pKa scale in acetonitrile of below two units. So that means these rival the acidity of super acids and triflimid, for example. But in addition to this, they have a unique feature, and we call this confinement. So around this is acid functionality, a confined pocket evolves with this catalyst design, simulating somewhat how enzymes catalyze their reactions. And with this special combination of high acidity and confinement, a number of unique transformations have been realized in recent years, and I would like to highlight six of them to you. Number one is a cross-aldo re reaction or a Mukayama aldo reaction of the acetaldehyde-derived enol silane with yet another aldehyde to give the corresponding aldol product in excellent enantioselectivity. Looks kind of simple, but in fact it's an amazing transformation because previously this combination of an enol silane of acetaldehyde with yet another aldehyde would just lead to polymerization because as surely you have noticed, both the starting material and the product have an identical functional group, an alpha unbranched aliphatic aldehyde. And yet, with the magic of these confined acids, the product is simply not a substrate anymore for the catalyst, and it ends after a single aldolization to make these very important aldol products. We can also catalyze other 
mukayama aldo reactions of ketin acetals with ketones. And that was a challenging reaction at the time. And not only can we do this, but we can do this with parts per million catalyst loading. In fact, in this paper, we describe one example where we use below one part per million as the catalyst, which I think is the lowest catalyst loading that has ever been used in any catalytic asymmetric carbon carbon bond forming reaction. There might be enzymes that are as good as this, but I'm at least not aware of them. We can catalyze diels alder reactions, but not just the usual ones, but very challenging ones where we combine unreactive dienes with unreactive dienophiles and make these cyclohexene products for the first time catalytically and with high enantioselectivity. We can also catalyze heterodiels alder reactions of now all types of dienes with all types of aldehydes to give these useful products here. And it's kind of remarkable to realize that such a transformation was unprecedented even with achiral catalysts. So it's actually even unusual reactivity that is enabled by these confined strong acids. We can also now, with this high reactivity, finally activate olefins for asymmetric catalysis. This has been the domain of transition metal catalysis, but now actually organocatalysis for the first time can also enable the activation of simple olefins, in this case to form the corresponding carbocations, which then engage in a nucleophilic addition to form tetrahydrofuranes. And very last but not least, I would like to share one recent discovery in my group. We have found that IDPI catalysts can actually mediate the addition of TMS cyanide to 2-butanone. Looks simple, but it turns out this product of this cellular cyanation reaction is a valuable intermediate in the synthesis of two pharmaceuticals. And it also turns out that all previously developed chiral catalysts for cellular cyanations and hydrocyanation reactions, and these include very sophisticated transition metal complexes, even more sophisticated organocatalysts, and also very advanced enzymes and even engineered enzymes and none of these catalysts was able to deliver this product with greater than 95 to 5 ER. So this is actually a milestone I would argue in the history of organocatalysis. We're very excited about this because finally this are now able to design organic molecules that enable enzyme-like selectivity and reactivity seems to become true. And I think we're just opening a door here and I expect still an exciting and, and a great future for asymmetric organocatalysis and I'm very, very happy uh, to be part of this. So with this, I would like to finally thank my wonderful co-workers who have supported this adventure during the last 20 years. I had the privilege to work with amazing, brilliant, hardworking and very creative people during those years and I would like to thank all of them wholeheartedly. I would also like to thank the funding agencies that have supported us. Most importantly though, the Max Planck Society, which has given me the freedom and the privilege to really pursue an idea to the depth that I wanted it to pursue. And this was really a great honor and I feel very uh, happy to have been part of this awesome club. And uh, last but not least, I would also like to show you a picture of October 6, when we celebrated at our institute and it was really a delight to see the joy of all the co-workers of our Max Planck Institute for Kohlenforschung in Mülheim, the woodworker, the steel worker, the glass blowers, the cleaning personnel, the administration, my colleagues, all the graduate students and postdocs, the technicians. It was just an institute in an excited state full of joy and that made me uh, even more happy and I'm, I feel really, really honored and rewarded with this. If you're interested in the names of all the co-workers that have worked in my group, they're listed on this PowerPoint here. And last but not least, I would like to acknowledge uh, the most important people in my life, meine geliebte Familie. Vielen Dank, ihr Lieben, meine süßen Jungs und meine Frau, dass ihr in all den Jahren so an meiner Seite gestanden habt und Katalyse-Fans geworden seid. Tausend Dank. David Macmillan was born in 1968 in Bells Hill, Scotland. He obtained his PhD in 1996 from the University of California, Irvine. He is currently the James McDonald Distinguished University Professor at Princeton University in the United States. David Macmillan, I now welcome you onto the stage. We are very much looking forward to your lecture.
Okay, I'd like to begin by thanking the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences. I'd like to thank the Nobel Committee in Chemistry. I'd like to congratulate the other co-recipient of this prize, Benjamin List, and all of the other 2021 Nobel Prize winners. And I'd like to thank you all for your attention this morning. The last two months has really been just remarkable for me. It's been an extremely exciting time. And during that time, I've been asked many, many questions. But probably the number one question I've been asked is this one, which is shown here. What is asymmetric organocatalysis? So I thought I'd begin my talk today by breaking down each of these terms. The first term I want to tell you about is catalysis. What is catalysis? Well, catalysis is related to chemical reactions. If you look around you right now, everything is made from a chemical reaction. In fact, if I look in my office, and this is my desk, Every component, every material that's in my office is made by a chemical reaction. Now, if we look at all those different chemical reactions and we actually hone in on one of them, for example, this one shown here, this is actually the chemical reaction to make caffeine. This is the molecule which is found in your coffee. Require energy. Most chemical reactions do not happen spontaneously. And to represent that, most chemists use what's called an energy diagram. Now, I'm not going to be so technical here. I just want to show you what this energy diagram looks like. And one aspect I like about this is when I teach this to undergraduates, I always explain it in the following way. Imagine every night when you're going home, you actually have to walk over a hill. To walk over a hill to get home would obviously require a lot of energy every single night. What catalysis does, catalysis actually lowers the barrier and in fact introduces a tunnel to make it so much easier for you to get home every night. And in the same way, it does this for chemical reactions. It makes all chemical reactions easier and faster. So that's exactly what catalysis is. Reactions are easier, faster, and in many cases, allows new chemical reactions to take place. Now, you may ask yourself, does catalysis really impact the world? And it does, and it does in many different interesting ways, but I thought I'd just show you a few. So here's the first one. This is the population of our Earth over the last 1,000 years. And you can see here, it's been pretty stable during that time frame till the beginning of the 20th century. And at that point, you see this rapid inflection. And at this moment, it climbs up to 8 billion people on Earth. Now, it turns out it would not have been possible to have these 8 billion people on Earth without this one catalytic reaction, which is shown here. This is the conversion of nitrogen over to ammonia. Now, you may ask yourself, well, why do we need ammonia? Well, we need ammonia to make food, and we would not have enough food on our planet for those 8 billion people without this one catalytic reaction. And in fact, if you think about your body right now, and you think about all the building blocks that are in your body, 50% of those building blocks contain nitrogens that came from this one catalytic reaction. Now, other ways that catalysis impacts our world is that 90% of industrial-scale chemical reactions at the present time actually use catalysis and 35% of the world's GDP is also based on catalysis. And this number is actually only going to go up over the next couple of decades as we move towards more and more sustainable processes. Now, if you're wondering how does catalysis impact your day-to-day -day life, it does so in, in many different ways. We've talked already about why we need it to make food, but also we need it to make medicines, we need it for solar cells, we need it for diagnostics, even the global manufacturing of polymers and materials, we need catalysis. So clearly, catalysis is important for our world. So that's great. That's catalysis. But the next part is, what about asymmetric? What does asymmetric mean? Well, it turns out it's actually pretty easy to describe what asymmetric means to non-chemists. Because most people on Earth have two hands, or you have two feet. And if you look at your two hands, we know that they're, in fact, mirror images of each other. Those mirror images are similar, but they're still different. They're different because they're not superimposable, which makes them asymmetric. So how do we know that? Well, we know that, for example, if you were to take a left-hand glove, you know that it fits on your left hand. But if you take that same glove and try to put it on your right hand, you know that your right hand will not recognize that glove. It simply doesn't fit. And that's what you call it being asymmetric. Now, what's really interesting in organic chemistry the same phenomenon happens. And these are two organic molecules which are in fact mirror images of each other, but they're similar, but they're still different. Which brings up an interesting question. In a lab, how do you differentiate between these two mirror image compounds? And it turns out that's not so easy. In fact, 
It requires really expensive instruments and it requires a, a pretty long period of time. What's really also interesting about this, however, if you take these same two mirror images and give them to most humans, in this case, this is a picture of my daughter Emma when she was three years old. It turns out even a three-year-old child can take these two compounds and differentiate them instantly just by smelling them. They can smell the difference between these two compounds. Now, you may be wondering why is that? Well, that happens because biology, human biology, is made up of building blocks which are one mirror image but not the other one. So for example, proteins, DNA, carbohydrates, hormones, all these building blocks of life are made up of one mirror image but not the other one. Now, it turns out that has lots of really important biological implications. The easiest one to sort of talk about is with respect to medicine. Because it turns out while your hands can exist as mirror image, it turns out many medicines also can exist as mirror images. And it turns out your body can typically recognize one of those mirror images, but the other mirror image can often be problematic. It can be toxic, it can be dangerous. Now, this is a $100 billion market for our economy, and as such, it's extremely important that we can have access to one of these mirror images of the medicine, but not the other one. And the way you can think about going about doing that would obviously be through catalysis. And this, therefore, becomes known as asymmetric catalysis, or the desire to make one mirror image selectively without making the other one. Okay, so that's asymmetric. So the third part of this is organo. What does organo mean? And to explain this, I'm going to take you all the way back to 1996. Discuss what were the branches of asymmetric catalysis back in 1996. And it turns out there were two major branches. The first branch was biocatalysis. Biocatalysis is when you take enzymes from your body or living systems and you use those to make one mirror image in preference to the other one. The second major branch is metal catalysis. Metal catalysis is a man-made area which uses metals to allow you to make one mirror image selectively. Now, if you're wondering why 1996, well, 1996 is where my part in this story actually begins. In 1996, I was finishing off my PhD studies at UC Irvine out in California. Now, over the last two months, many people have said to me, you must feel extremely lucky, extremely fortunate to have won a Nobel Prize. And I tell them, well, I actually already feel extremely lucky and fortunate because I got to do my PhD studies out in California at UC Irvine. This was a really wonderful, fantastic time for me. And during that time, I was also extremely fortunate that I got to work for this individual. This is Professor Larry Overman. He's just a fantastic chemist. He's an amazing mentor, but he's also really just a superb human being. Upon completing my PhD studies, I moved back across America, went to Boston to, to Harvard, and I went to Harvard to work for Professor David Evans. David Evans is a genius. He's one of the most influential chemists that's existed, and he's someone who is an absolute master in the area of asymmetric catalysis. And I moved to Dave's lab to work in this area, and during that time I worked on looking at metals to make single mirror imaging compounds. Now, these are the, some of the metals that Dave's group actually worked on. And during that time, I learned an enormous amount from Dave and from his team. But every single day I was in Dave's lab, I worked in this contraption. This contraption is known as a glove box. This glove box is designed to exclude air, it's designed to exclude oxygen, it's designed to exclude moisture. And every single day I would be in there, I'd be working away for many, many hours. And after about two years of working in a glove box, I started to think to myself, why are we spending so much time in a glove box every day? To understand that, you have to think about the metal catalyst themselves. So here is your typical metal catalyst. You can actually break it down into two components. The left-hand side and the right-hand side is shown here. The right-hand side is the metal. If you think about these metals, it turns out metals, in some cases, but not in all cases, they can be expensive, they can be toxic, they can be really difficult to work with, they often have problems being out in the atmosphere, which is why you have to use glove boxes. And in other cases, they're not sustainable. What's really interesting, however, if you look at the other part of the catalyst, this is the organic component. Organic molecules are often inexpensive, they're safe, they're sustainable, they're recyclable. And at that time, I started to think, well, why don't we just simply use the organic part as the catalyst and miss out using the metal? Now, that was something that eventually became known as organocatalysis. 
OK, so in 1998, at the end of my studies at Harvard, I was really fortunate. I landed a job as an assistant professor at Berkeley. But before I got to Berkeley, I stopped off at Caltech to give a lecture. And while I was there, I met with Professor Eric Carrera. And while I was there, Professor Carrera took me to dinner and gave me to what is, till this day, one of the best pieces of advice that anyone ever gave me. He basically said the following. He said, when you get to Berkeley, you're going to be surrounded by some of the best graduate students in the world. And you have to assume that whatever problem you work on, those students will help you solve that problem, regardless of whether you have a solution to it already or not. And as such, you should work on the one which is of the highest impact you can think of. So with this in mind, I knew what I was going to work on. I was going to work on organocatalysis. I knew that because of these advantages. We knew we could make them from nature's building blocks. We knew that these molecules should not be sensitive to air or moisture. They should be inexpensive. These same types of catalysts should be easy to handle. You wouldn't have to use a glove box because they can exist happily out in our environment. And then lastly, they should be sustainable. They should be recyclable, and they're non-toxic. But this was not the main reason I was interested in doing organocatalysis. The part that I was interested in was the following idea. Instead of trying to develop one organocatalyst that would work for one transformation, I was really interested in the idea, could we develop an organocatalyst that could work for hundreds of different reactions, and maybe this could become a field of asymmetric catalysis. Now, that in and of itself was a pretty grandiose sort of idea. The only problem was I had absolutely no idea how to do it. But that's OK, because Eric Carrera told me it'd be fine. I'd have great graduate students. They would help me solve this problem. OK, so in 1998, off I went to Berkeley, started my research group. And this is one of my first photographs of that group. I really love this photograph. It's taken at 10 past 10 on a Friday night. You can see this young group in there doing research, trying to have an impact. And during that time, one of the graduate students in the group, by the name of Tristan Lambert, Tristan is now a, a very successful professor over at Cornell University. But back as a first-year graduate student, he asked me a very simple question. He said, what is the mechanism of reductive amination? And I was a new professor. I was all excited to answer this. I ran to the board. And I wrote, well, we take a carbonyl. You take an amine. And it reversibly forms an aminium ion. And it's only when it's the aminium ion does it have the electronic configuration that it's reactive enough to do the subsequent chemistry. And right there, right then, is when I had my eureka moment. Because I suddenly realized you could use this idea for organocatalysis. More specifically, you could take these alpha beta unsaturated carbonyls with amines and reversibly form in many amines. And in many ways, this should emulate a field of catalysis that had already been successful using metals. Now, to sort of show this in a slightly more conventional way, if you think of these two equations as shown in this slide as being simultaneous, the one on the top is one that uses metals. And it turns out there's hundreds of reactions that have been developed using that concept. But the one at the bottom, there was basically no examples using organic catalysts to do that. But yet, if these were simultaneous equations, they both should be successful. And if that's the case, then organocatalysts should work for many different types of transformations, such as Muki Amamiko, nitro and cycle additions. The list would go on and on and on of all the possible reactions for organocatalysis. But at that time, there really weren't any. So we had to pick one of these. One of these we wanted to test it on. And what we chose was the Diels-Alder reaction. Now, the Diels-Alder reaction is really famous to all chemists. It deservedly won the Nobel Prize in 1950 because it allowed you to take relatively simple molecules and build ring systems very much in a straightforward fashion that could be used in natural products, that could be used in medicines, that could actually be used in materials. We decided this reaction would be a great platform or a great venue on which to test our new organocatalysis concept. So we decided to use exactly that. So as shown here, this is actually the notebook page from Kateria Rent. She was a first year graduate student in my group. She was the first person in my group to test this idea. And these are, in fact, the components of a Diels Alder reaction. And you can see in the middle above the arrow, that would be the organocatalyst. So we tested it. We ran the reaction. And if we scroll all the way at the bottom, you'll see the result, which is highlighted. It says, not racemic. Not racemic. That was unbelievably exciting to us. Not racemic means it makes one mirror image in preference to the other one. I was so excited when I saw this result. I went into my office, closed the door, jumped up and down for about five minutes, called my wife, and said, I think we're going to get tenure. We just got a really, really exciting result. 
But when my feet came back to ground, I walked back into the lab, and I realized that you can see at the top of this slide, it says an initial result, 48% EE. What does that mean? Well, that meant, in terms of the mirror images, there was a 48% excess of one mirror image over the other one. And for the chemistry community to take this seriously, that number actually has to be about 90%. So we had a decision to make. Did we want to publish this, or did we want to try and go for a catalyst and go for the gusto and get to 90%? Well, we decided to do the latter, and I can tell you that was six of the most nerve-wracking months of my life. But during that time, we eventually got to a, a catalyst that we thought was interesting. This is what's called the imidazolinones. We're interested in imidazolinones really for two major reasons. The first one was they were really inexpensive. If you look at these molecules, they're actually made from phenylalanine, which is a sort of building block of life. It's an amino acid. It's combined with acetone. Acetone is actually a paint stripper. But the other reason we really liked them, we thought if we put these together and made a catalyst, they should be good at being able to generate the production of one mirror image in preference to the other one. And when we tested that, that's exactly what happened. We could now achieve 90% excesses of one and the other in these deals all the reactions. So again, this was an extremely exciting day in lab. And at this point, we're now, we have to tell the world. As a young professor, you now have to write a manuscript and you really want to sort of climb up to the highest rooftop and shout this out as much as possible how important you think this is. And in fact, when I look back on my first manuscript, I can see I really felt that in this opening paragraph. In this opening paragraph, I first of all talk about why I think this is going to have potential impacts on society, for academia, for industry, and for the economy. The second thing I did in this opening paragraph, I gave this whole idea a name. I called it organocatalysis. Now, you might wonder, organocatalysis, why, why does it matter you gave something a name? What's in a name? But it turns out naming things is really, really important. For example, you can go back to Jan Jacobs uh, Berzelius, a very famous Swedish chemist, very famous scientist. And while he was a tremendously successful researcher, he was also the person that came up with so much vocabulary and so much terms that allow our field to have a, basically an identity at the present time. Words such as catalysis, protein, polymer, even organic versus inorganic. And the importance of terms have carried forward even into the modern era. For example, things such as machine learning, nanotechnology, organocatalysis. These are umbrella terms which really allow you to describe fields that allow them to gel and grow beneath those certain different types of areas. But the third part of this opening paragraph of the, or manuscript, which I'm most proud of, is that we introduce the concept of a generic activation mode. Now, you may wonder, what is a generic activation mode? But that's really just the idea of saying that this idea of catalysis should work not for one reaction, but for many, many chemical reactions. So obviously, we had to go off and test that. So if you remember, we've just performed the diels alder reaction, which is shown here. So we're now we're ready to test it in other reactions, and we try it, and it goes bam, bam, nothing. It comes to a screeching halt. And this is something that happens in science quite often, where you get proof of concept using one catalyst, but you suddenly realize it's not going to take you all the different directions you want to go in. So now we have to go off and design a second generation catalyst. Now, with this in mind, I was very fortunate to have really two fantastic young graduate students in my group by the name of Joel Austin and Chris Borps. And what they did was they performed molecular engineering on this first catalyst. They effectively took away two carbons, and then they introduced four carbons in a different shape. This was sort of precision engineering. To try and describe this to non-chemists that don't, or to put it in another context, one way I thought I could do this is to talk about, for example, this footballing god, Zlatan Ibrahimovic, who is someone who is a precision footballer who does precise things and achieves really fantastic outcomes. One example of this is this goal he scores where you can see here he does an overhead kick, uh, from almost 40 yards out to score this goal. Now, okay, he wasn't playing a, against a team that was particularly good, but the point here is he performs a precision technique to score a beautiful outcome, a really beautiful goal. And we were interested, could we do the same with our catalyst? So we set out to test this. This was our first generation catalyst. We had three reactions. We now moved to our second generation catalyst, as shown here, and now we're off to the races. Things really start uh, taking off like gangbusters. At this stage, we're also very fortunate that Carl Anker Jorgensen and Hayashi introduced another family of catalysts, which were also really valuable for aluminium catalysis, and again, completely expanded this area. 
All right, now at this point, what we've introduced is a minium catalysis, and basically at the same time, there was all this beautiful work coming from Ben List and Carlos Barbas, really expanding beautifully enamine catalysis. But I don't want to give you the impression we were the only people who were doing this. In fact, we certainly weren't even the first ones to do it. There was many other people who were sort of working in this area, and I want to point those out. For phase transfer catalysis, there was Doling, LIGO, Marioka, and O'Donnell. In Lewis based catalysis, there was Denmark, Ezeki, and Winberg. In terms of nucleophilic catalysis, there was Fu and Vidaeus. In terms of peptide and partial peptide synthesis, there was Kelowna, Inui, Julia, and Miller. In carbene catalysis, there was Enders, Leeper, and Tom Rovis. And in terms of hydrogen bonding catalysis, there was Corey and Jacobson. In ketone catalysis, there was Xi and Yang. And one part I want to mention, which I think is absolutely critical, if it wasn't for the contributions of all these people, this field simply would not exist. And I certainly wouldn't be standing here right now giving this speech. Okay, so at this stage, we started to think about what other directions we could take organocatalysis into. And one thing we thought of was, wouldn't it be interesting if you could take a minium and enamine catalysis and put them in the same vessel? And you might wonder, why on earth would you want to do that? Well, it turns out we were interested in emulating the way that nature makes molecules. It turns out what nature does, nature actually takes enzymes in a sort of biochemical assembly line and in multiple catalytic reactions takes simple molecules and makes very complex ones. We started to ask, could we do exactly the same thing, but instead of using enzymes, could we actually use small organic molecules to do exactly the same catalytic cascades? So in this context, we took a relatively simple molecule, as the one shown in the top left here, and we put it through these three catalytic cycles that all sequentially fed into each other to generate the molecule which is shown in the bottom right hand side of this slide. Now that molecule is much more complex than the one in the top left and the reason it's so much more complex is we're trying to make the molecule shown in this slide which is called strychnine. Now you've probably heard of the word strychnine before. It's actually a very dangerous molecule. It's actually a poison. It's really a rat poison and you may wonder why on earth we're trying to make rat poison. Well, it turns out this rat poison, strychnine, is actually a molecular benchmark that people in the field of total synthesis use from which to benchmark their technologies against. And using this cascade catalysis, we were able to, in fact, make it in a very rapid 12 steps. Now, other ways we started to think about ways we could do exciting and new things with organocatalysis was the idea, could we merge it with other types of reactivity? The next type of reactivity we became interested in was organic radicals. So this is Moses Gomberg. He was the person who discovered radicals in 1901 and has this really wonderful statement in his manuscript which says, this work will be continued and I wish to reserve the field for myself. Well, clearly that did not happen. All of the chemistry world started to use radicals. And the reason was because as the name suggests, radicals allow you to do radical things. They allow you to achieve radical reactivity. And so we became really interested in, could you merge this with organocatalysis? So this was actually work that was conceived of and executed on by a really fantastic graduate student in my group by the name of Teresa Beeson. What Teresa did was she said, I should be able to make these same enamines, but instead of using these enamines to do chemistry, what if we actually plucked an electron out to change its reactivity now that it's a radical? This radical should allow you to do many, many different new types of chemical reactions. And that turned out to be exactly the case. We published many new types of processes using what's called this SOMO catalysis. But this actually became a stepping stone for us to think about, could we actually take radicals and organocatalysis and make it even more sustainable in terms of how you would actually perform these transformations? And in this context, we became really excited about the fact of being able to sort of harness visible light with organocatalysis. Now, harnessing visible light is something that inorganic chemists have been working on for almost three decades. And the idea here was to try and harness the, the, the light that would come from the sun and use that as energy to power the planet. We became interested in the idea, could we take the, that knowledge that they had developed, but now transport it into the organic world, and once it was in the organic world, start to think about doing a thing called photoredox catalysis. This would allow us to make new bonds, this would allow us to perform new types of transformations that could have a whole variety of different applications. Now, it turns out this was actually work that was performed in collaboration with a wonderful postdoc in my group by the name of Dave Nesevich. And this is basically what we're attempting, it's shown in this slide. We're taking light bulbs, we're taking organocatalysis, and then at the right moment, we switch, simply switch on the light, we switch on the blue LED, and new chemistry starts to happen.
edox is that it became a field in and of itself. It actually became a field as, as large as organocatalysis, and that's something that we are very much proud to be a part of. Now, in terms of thinking about this, the part that's really exciting is we've been really lucky as a group to be involved with organocatalysis, and we've also been really lucky to be involved with this field of photoradox catalysis, but it's been really exciting to see that organocatalysis effectively created this bridge, at least in our lab, into photoradox catalysis. In fact, if you think about it, it really was a catalyst that allowed photoradox catalysis field to come together, again, at least in our lab. Okay. So at this point, another question that a lot of people ask me, are, what about applications of organocatalysis? And I'm going to show you just a few. The first one is in the area of fragrances, perfumes. It turns out perfumes are used on an enormous scale across the world every single day. And Fermanish, this company that's in Switzerland, in Geneva, are very successful at performing and producing many of these different perfumes. And one of the ones which is actually shown here is produced by combining organocatalysis with photoradars. This actually makes lily of the valley. Turns out Fermanish, also in northern India, make 300 metric tons of this beautiful rose-smelling perfume, also using organocatalysis. Okay, so that's perfumes. What other areas can you use organocatalysis for? Well, you can actually use it in terms of materials and actually for the recyclable plastic economy. This is some very important work that's being conducted by Bob Weymouth and James Hedrick. And many of you probably know that plastics are polluting our oceans. And what Bob and James are doing is they're using organocatalysis to effectively break down polymers back down to monomers, which can then be used again to remake polymers, making polymers and plastics completely recyclable and completely sustainable, which is obviously extremely important. But the area in which organocatalysis is probably most heavily used is that towards making medicines or developing medicines. I'm just going to show you one example. This is Talsegipan. It's actually used to treat chronic migraines. This particular molecule, this particular medicine, is actually made, and it's made using organocatalysis. And in fact, it uses the aminium catalysis I talked about at the beginning of my talk to make one of the mirror images in preference to the other one. But the last thing I want to talk about with respect to the value of organocatalysis is this slide which is shown here, and we call this democratizing catalysis. Now, this is an aspect of organocatalysis I certainly did not see coming, but I think it may be one of the most important aspects of organocatalysis. And it is that organocatalysis is extremely affordable and a cheap and accessible field to the whole world. And this means if you go across every continent that exists in the world right now, people are being educated about organocatalysis using these different systems. They're so inexpensive to the point that it's really straightforward for people not just to learn about using them, but actually to do their own research. So when I think about where the next big idea in organocatalysis is going to come from, I realize it's not going to be about resources, it's not going to be about funding, it's going to be about who in the world has the best idea, regardless of which country they come from. Okay, now people often ask me, what does the future hold for organocatalysis? And to be honest with you, I really don't have an answer to that question. But what I do know is that we have to provide for our sort of ever expanding global population in a responsible way, and that includes catalysis. Catalysis has to be sustainable as we go forward. So clearly, this will involve using organocatalysis and biocatalysis, but it will also include things like photocatalysis and electrocatalysis. It's going to be essential that we move to these types of catalysis if we're going to create sustainable technologies for our planet. Okay, so that's my last chemistry slide. I want to finish off by thanking the people who, first of all, did this work. I talked about the people already from Berkeley. We moved to Caltech, where we actually did most of our organocatalysis research, and I want to thank all the people who are sort of shown on this slide here. This was a fantastic group to work with, and I also want to thank also all my friends and the faculty members out at Caltech. In 2006, we actually moved over to Princeton. We continued our organocatalysis work, and also we started doing lots of photoredox as well. And again, I have to thank this phenomenal groups, these phenomenal teams I, I was lucky to work with during that time frame. In terms of other people I have to thank, I have to thank this woman. This is my wife, Jean. She's a love of my life. She is an amazing person. She's an amazing chemist. She's an amazing mother. But more than anything, she's my best friend. And this journey, honestly, would not have been the same without her being there. So I have to thank her so much. I also have to thank my family. This is Danielle, this is Lauren, this is Emma, this is us having a boogie 
on the Harbour Bridge in Sydney, which was a lot of fun that day. And I also have to thank Julie. Julie is my unique and wonderful mother-in-law who's been an amazing supporter through all of our times as we went all through all these different stages of our life. In terms of other people I have to thank, I have to thank my siblings, Ian and Lorraine. Uh, many people have heard this story that I would not have went to university if it wasn't for my brother going there first. But I think people haven't heard the story that I wouldn't have survived university if it wasn't for my sister Lorraine. So I just want to say to them, I, I love you both, and I can't wait to celebrate with both of you. Other people I have to thank, I have to thank educators that basically, first of all, the educators all over Scotland who work very tirelessly to take people like me and try to put them into a better spot. I have to thank the teachers at the Stevenson Primary Belsall Academy, and I have to thank the faculty and staff at University of Glasgow. And again, without these people, I certainly wouldn't be standing on this stage. The last part um, is I want to dedicate this talk, and I want to dedicate this talk to three people who are not here. The, the first person I want to dedicate this to, I've already mentioned, and that's Carlos Barbas. Carlos was a pioneer of organocatalysis. He was right there at the beginning with myself and Ben. Unfortunately, he was taken away from us too early in 2014. And over the last two months, I think about Carlos every single day. And it would have been so wonderful if Carlos had been here to celebrate this with both myself and Ben. The last people I want to dedicate this to are my mom and dad. Um, this is a very difficult thing for me, but basically someone recently said to me, how would your mom and dad felt about this? Would they have been proud? Would they have been proud of you winning this prize? And I said that I don't have the words, I can't articulate how, how proud they would be. I just can't get there. But the one thing I can tell you is a seven-year-old boy in Scotland, there's no way I could imagine I'd be standing on this stage giving this speech, but I think my mom and dad could have because they were unbelievably supportive and they believed that myself and my family, we could go absolutely anywhere. And for that, I'm incredibly grateful. With that, I want to thank you for your attention. Thanks a lot.